Well, a push to phase out smoking in Tasmania, creating a smoke-free generation, has been hotly debated this week. The move comes a week after the tobacco industry lost a High Court challenge against plain packaging on cigarettes. Well, critics have labelled the Tasmanian proposal paternalist and or a nanny state, while public health advocates believe governments have a responsibility to protect its citizens. Well, to look at both sides of the debate, we're joined here in the studio Professor Simon Chapman from the University of Sydney and James Patterson from the Institute of Public Affairs in Melbourne. Welcome to both of you. Simon, let's start with you. Uh, we've seen this proposal in Tasmania. A lot of people would see it as radical. Is it the right move to be telling, to be, to be telling people what they cannot do as far as smoking is concerned? Look, 95% of people who smoke uh, regret having ever started and about 40% try to quit each year and a vast majority of them fail to do so. I've never met a parent who wanted their children to grow up to be a smoker and when you think about it we've only had the tobacco epidemic that we've had in quite recent history. First sort of lung cancer cases started appearing in 1930 and then they started going down in about 1980. Right, so it's the, still the leading cause of cancer death right around the world. We're getting on top of it, and I guess that historically we're at a point now where governments are starting to say, how much longer do we really need to have this industry hooking our kids and... Uh, but know, do we really need to criminalise it? What, isn't education enough? Education gets us so far. I mean, with all the education that we've had in this country, we've still got 15% of people who are smoking on a daily basis. Um, once we get down to sort of, say, below 5%, uh, it's anyone's guess what will happen, whether it will go the same way as sort of public spitting, you know, you don't see it very often, or whether it will just sort of hang there. But I think that what the proposal is in Tasmania is that uh, anyone who was born after the year uh, 2000 in other words, by the time they get to 2018, when it's adult age, they won't be able to buy cigarettes after that. And so, you know, people who are criticising this are sort of saying, oh, no, 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 we, we, we want to be able to sort of continue on something that in recent, it's only been in recent history that we've had this ghastly product. James Patterson, if we can just bring you in here now to uh, put your side of um, this particular debate and, you know, will this proposal, if it was to go ahead in Tasmania, to ban um, cigarette smoking for those who will be 18 in 2018, is, is this the right way to go? Look, it's a completely ridiculous proposal. We have tried prohibition before and it was a devastating failure which had, which had a series of unintended consequences. When in the United States they banned the sale of alcohol across the country, it led to a serious increase in crime, it created the Mafia as a national organised crime syndicate and it was a disaster and was reversed very quickly. Uh, these kind of proposals are extremely draconian, they will not work and the idea that some people should be banned from using a product which is legal and available to everyone else just because of the year they were born is also extremely illiberal. James, wouldn't you agree though education is not necessarily working? Uh, well, that's if you believe that everybody should do what you think. Now, I don't like smoking. I've tried it once or twice. It was very unpleasant, and so I choose not to smoke, and I know the risks of smoking. I don't think anyone would argue that, there are, that Australians don't all understand the risk of smoking. Some people, still understanding the risk of smoking, choose to smoke. I think that's their choice. People should be able to make decisions which I think are bad. I shouldn't impose my moral code on them just because I think I've made a better choice than they have. It doesn't mean I should use the power of government to stop them making their decisions. Simon, and uh, James makes the point. Prohibition. Look, it's, I think it's a very facile comparison with prohibition in the, uh, you know, the US period. And what a lot of people don't understand is that, yes, while it did cause a lot of crime, it also drastically reduced the amount of alcohol which was ac actually consumed around that time. People always concentrate on the, the downsides of it. But I don't think that, uh, you know, with only 15% of uh, the, the, the community smoking and children's smoking rates now are down to record lows, we've never seen them lower than they have been at the moment, that by the time we get to 2018, with all the community support and the radical, rapid social change about the way that people feel about smoking, the idea that there will be a large market amongst children that will be comparable to what went on in Prohibition in the United States with alcohol is just ludicrous. So why so not Simon's have... argument there is Simon's argument there is an alert, is an analogy that is effectively, if it's a small enough minority, we can impose our values on it. Now that's an extraordinary position to take in public. 
public policy. If the group is small enough that we can persecute it easily, then we should do so. Yeah, well, I think what we have to understand is that James's organisation, the Institute of Public Affairs, is basically just a, a sort of a voice for the tobacco industry. They are funded by them. They've admitted it recently. So he's just sort of running errands for his employers at the moment. And I think we need to understand what he's saying in that context. It's very disappointing that Simon, as a public health act, is not able to rise above petty insults and attacks on individuals. Well, I he mean, are you facts. denying that you're funded the by the industry? Si Simon is unable to deal with the facts and the matters of debate. He can't deal on the, on the level of moral philosophy. So all he can do is argue and try and smear other people in the debate. It is the weakest political tactic. It is the weakest look, debate tactic. Look, if we want and to talk about highly facts, James, the it facts talks a lot are... About, it says a lot about your evidence. The facts are that 15,000 Australians die from tobacco each year in this country. Five million around the world, and that the errands that your organisation is running for that industry are really quite despicable. And you know, that's the sort of fact that I'd like Simon, to leave viewers with. Simon, what I do here is represent our members. We have more than 2,000 members of the IPA, mm. and they're ordinary people like you and me. And they pay a fee of $88 mm. or $209 every year to support our values. Is and our values are small government, individual freedom, and personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. We will always stand up for those values in public debate, and I'm very proud to work for an organisation that has a clear moral code in public debate. All right, can we make some comparisons here? Let's, for instance, look at the issue of seat belts, where it's obviously mandatory in every state and territory to wear a seat belt. And uh, James, is that a fair comparison? It has clearly saved many lives. You have no question it saved many lives uh, and, it, and it's a sensible thing and no one really... Oh, it's a shocking that. interference uh, with freedom, isn't it, James? Uh, Simon, I don't think there's anybody, I've never met anybody who seriously thinks that. Well, uh, there's a difference between. I mean, it is an interference with freedom. It's the state telling individuals what they have to do to protect themselves. It's paternalism, Simon, it pure is, and simple. It is an extremely, extremely minor infringement on liberty. It doesn't prevent you from driving your car. It doesn't prevent you from going where you want to go. But banning smoking actually prevents you from doing something that you choose to engage in in a rational way. Um, it's, I think it's a very different... Uh, do you think most uh, nicotine addicts choose to keep on smoking, James? Well, by definition, yes, they do. That's exactly what they do when they go and pay for the cigarettes once a week or twice a week or once a day. That's a, that's a rational choice that they make. That's making. why they spend uh, millions of dollars on nicotine replacement therapy products to try and get them, get them off. Yeah, that's right. And many people successfully quit and good on them. And that just proves that it is possible to quit and people do make choices about the, their habits. Simon, if I could just um, put to you, uh, in terms of this question about, you know, prohibition and, and those sorts of things, why not advocate then for a wholesale ban on smoking? Well, because I think it would be completely impractical when you've got 15% of the, of the community still smoking to do that. That's where you would get a serious black market. But with the small percentage of kids who are smoking these days moving through and moving it through right up until the age of, you know, to the year 2018, I think that that would be a practical and sensible thing. Simon Chapman, James Patterson, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.